Today we are very fortunate to have uh, Francis Frank. Frank. Gavin, Professor Gavin uh, comes to us from MIT, but with an illustrious background of academic postings. Frank comes to us this morning with a kind of good news, bad news story. Okay, bad news first. <laughs> we got it wrong. We got the Cold War wrong, we got deterrence wrong, we got proliferation theory wrong, we got it wrong for a lot of reasons. We built our understanding of the nuclear world around a series of myths that we convinced ourselves must be true. And we let nuclear alarmism inform our policy. So we got that wrong too. Okay, good news, it's not too late. <laughs> we can fix it. And in fact, uh, if you go back and look at the history, re-look at the history, that we can refine our understanding, that we can do some course corrections and really improve uh, our, our understanding of the, the history and the theory and therefore improve our policy basis. And another good news story, and we've uh, mentioned this several times, uh, is that we are living in a renaissance, a new age of uh, nuclear strategy scholarship. And in fact, Professor Gavin is the Stanton chair, and we've heard this before, <coughs> and we've had uh, the good fortune of, uh, of, of hosting a series of these Stanton Fellows. Uh, and this was a, uh, a grant that was made to uh, enrich our understanding of nuclear statecraft, and it is, uh, I think, having some results. And so uh, uh, Frank is the Stanton Chair of Nuclear uh, Security at, at MIT. So what I'm going to lay out for you today, and it's a little different than the strategy I used in my book and a recent article I wrote in International Security about um, the history of U.S. nuclear nonproliferation policy, where when you kind of lay things out in publications, you say, these are the five things that I know to be true, these are the four things people said that are wrong about, and so on and so forth. And instead, today, what I'm going to highlight two things. Uh, the first, I'm going to talk about some of the questions that we have that we often think we know the answers to, but if we dig down a little more deeply, there's a little less certainty there. That's not necessarily a problem, but we should acknowledge it. And then the second thing I'm going to do at the end, if we have time, is talk about what I call gaps in various communities on nuclear dynamics. Uh, I am a historian in a political science department who hangs out with policy people at a university that is dominated by scientists and engineers. And in fact, I'm co-chairing a search in nuclear science and engineering, and uh, I was telling someone earlier that if you judge success in life by doing things you're utterly and completely unqualified for, I've made it. <laughs> uh, so I am someone who's used to having kind of a unclear identity. Um, so I think that by identifying various communities that have a stake in commenting on nuclear dynamics and seeing why there's such great disagreement, um, with the goal in the end of finding a way of bringing these communities together is sort of uh, what I'm going to try to do here. So start with the puzzles. Of course, the history of the nuclear age, as we all know, is marked by a puzzle. Thermonuclear weapons are monstrous, potentially civilization-ending weapons whose use would not only be immoral and senseless, but increasingly unthinkable. Yet we intuit that it's the very destructiveness of these weapons that has pre prevented the recurrence of great power war since 1945. Why? Well, it doesn't take a deep knowledge of history to know that great power land wars had been the scourge of Eurasia for 31 years before the United States had dropped the atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing tens of millions on the battlefield and tens of millions more through disease and political upheaval. Seventy years ago, most responsible people expected a third war to follow the first and the second, with consequences far, far worse than the first. And thankfully, as we know, that war never came. And to misuse a title from a very famous book, this has led many people to proclaim 
Thank God for the atom bomb. Did nuclear weapons prevent World War III, and do these weapons have the intended effect of stabilizing world politics by making great power war unthinkable? This powerful notion is, as we all know, of course, the foundation of what we've come to call deterrence. And our whole way of thinking about nuclear weapons and world politics is centered upon this concept. Much of the United States national security strategy has been driven for well over a half a century with the idea that attack upon the United States and more importantly, I should add, its allies might elicit a nuclear response even if the adversary did not use nuclear weapons first. We've come to take this posture so for granted that we've long since forgotten how novel it is or how unusual given America's history that such a strategy is. Think about it for a moment. Since the U.S. founding until 1950, the United States never entered a permanent alliance, was almost completely demobilized during peacetime, pursued strategies that allowed it to be hit first and mobilized slowly and massively to win wars of attrition. This strategy allowed for powerful civilian control over the military and strong legislative oversight over the executive branch in matters of war and peace, while paving the way to relative isolation in world affairs. Nuclear weapons changed all of that. The nuclear revolution and the strategies the United States adopted to deal with it demanded permanent alliances, forward military deployments, and an often preemptive military strategy that left enormous discretion in the hands of battlefield commanders and permanently shifted the power to make war away from Congress to the President. I can't emphasize enough, sort of as a historian, what a profound, fundamental, and often unexamined change uh, this was in America's grand strategy and its political, diplomatic, and military orientation with the world. Again, this strategy was premised on the idea that deterrence, the promise of awful retribution if the United States was attacked, would keep the country relatively safe and the world relatively stable for decades. Most importantly, it is widely believed to have prevented thermonuclear war. But do we know this to be true? How can we be sure that thermonuclear weapons and the deterrence that flowed from them kept peace and stability? In fact, if we're honest, we cannot. The problem is that we're trying to understand something that, thank God, never happened and hopefully never will happen, a thermonuclear war. We have an almost impossible time as scholars understanding the causes for things that did happen, such as the First World War. I don't know if any of you uh, took a glance at some of the new scholarship on the July crisis that came out in the 100th anniversary of the First World War. Uh, I agreed to review all the major books, which is about to stack that high, and I'm pleased to report 100 years later there still is no consensus for what happened in July 1914. And that actually happened. <laughs> Trying to understand why something did not happen, why we did not have a thermonuclear war is a methodological nightmare, a situation that eludes certain answer from even our most powerful and sophisticated social science methods. While the idea of nuclear deterrence is intuitively compelling, one can imagine other explanations for the relative peace and stability of world affairs after 1945. About 25 years ago, scholar John Mueller argued uh, famously and very controversially that nuclear weapons were unneeded to keep the peace that the world had tired of war after two global conflagrations, that the overwhelming conventional might of the United States, what he called the Detroit deterrent, was enough to scare any possible rival, and that great possible war, like slavery or dueling, was a cultural practice that was increasingly seen as repulsive and not to be pursued. There are other possible explanations for the so-called long peace. For century, land had been the source of state power, but a variety of factors from massively increasing agricultural yields, we arguably have too much food in the world, not too little, uh, a problem I don't think our 100 years ago anyone could have imagined, to flattening demographic trends, to the development of post-industrial technologically driven economies, i.e. you'd rather be Singapore than the Ukraine, has made conquest too expensive and not worth the bother. There are lots of other explanations, from norms to taboos to military factors to explain the great absence of great power war since 1945, but the simple fact is that we don't know. Now, I, for myself, believe that nuclear deterrence made an enormous revolutionary difference. 
I, I actually believe the nuclear deterrence work, but I can't prove it. People will tell you, and I'm sure someone in Q&A will tell me that they can prove it, but certainty is impossible. Now, why does this point matter? As you know, there are two crucial trends shaping the nuclear policy world, pulling in completely different directions, and how you assess them depends on how you think about deterrence. The first is the disarmament movement, so-called global zero movement, or the idea that the world should move towards eliminating nuclear weapons. Now, I should point out this is officially an American aspiration, as we all know, laid out by President Obama in his 2009 Prox speech, though that was not the first president who thought this. You spend time in the records and you realize with one, possibly two exceptions, every American president since Truman wanted to rid the world of nuclear weapons. If they could have pushed a button <laughs> to make them go away, they would have. The exceptions are Nixon and maybe Eisenhower. But even we know Reagan was a, 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 more, a nuclear abolitionist. We um, all know, um, uh, so anyway, we know about this movement. On the other strand, uh, pulling in the other direction, is the idea that reveals, that says nuclear weapons are playing an increasing role in world politics. This year has been dominated by discussions over Iran's nuclear weapons program. We also know, less discussed, but perhaps in the long term equally important, that there's a significant expansion going on in Russia, China, and Pakistan's uh, nuclear weapons program. As you all know, uh, the U.S. is committed to a uh, many-year multi-billion, and if some in fact, if the figures David Sanger quotes are to be believed, a trillion dollars over 30 years, nuclear modernization um, program. So you have two different moves. One moving towards delegitimizing nuclear weapons and eventually eliminating. The other strand pulls in the opposite direction, highlighting the importance to states of nuclear weapons for achieving national security and foreign policy objectives, and as a side note, stabilizing world politics, which is correct. These worldviews and the policies that flow from them are enormously consequential and need vigorous argument and debate over them. The debate must recognize, however, that the answer to the most important questions, the ones that matter more than any other policy question that exists, I would argue, how to avoid nuclear war, will be difficult to know with certainty. We must be both rigorous and humble as we explore these issues. And of course, the right course also turns upon a number of other important questions, questions where answers are elusive as they are consequential. I'm going to identify three of them. These are three questions that, they're not, diff they're not complicated questions, but they're ones upon which many of the various communities that I'm going to talk about at the end of the talk argue are settled, but I would suggest they're not, and by the very definition of the fact that none of these communities agree to the answers means that they have to be debated. And at the very least, debating and thinking and revisiting these historical questions um, should help inform how you think about contemporary and future nuclear dilemmas and choices. They also get to the fundamental questions surrounding nuclear weapons, deterrence, peace, and stability. So question one, how close did we come to thermonuclear war during the Cold War? Now I'll say as a side note, one of the things I spend a lot of time in the book on is making clear that one doesn't conflate the Cold War with nuclear politics, right? When I grew up learning about all of this stuff, as judging by the color and amount of hair that I see in this room, that many people in this room learned about it, that the Cold War and the story of nuclear politics sort of traveled in the same direction. And in fact, if you dig down deeply, you see that they actually, nuclear politics, even during the Cold War, often had a different dynamic. But still, it is the one real example we have of intense nuclear competition. And so, the question of how close did thermonuclear war come to the Soviet and the United States in the Cold War is important. And there's at least three ways to look at this. First, throughout the Cold War, did nuclear weapons and the strategies the superpowers employed make great power war and a nuclear exchange more likely or less likely? Second, how did nuclear weapons affect the behavior of each state during a crisis? Um, and did it increase the risk of nuclear war 
or did it make it easier or har harder for the Soviets and the Americans to uh, escape crises without the risk of nuclear war? And third, how high were the risks of accidental nuclear launch or a nuclear accident? Now, I'm not going to answer these questions here, but I'm going to suggest that these are the kind of questions that you would want to have a vigorous historical debate and discussion, and the answers are not obvious. I think you can see, if you look at each of these three sub-questions, that nuclear weapons clearly had contradictory effects. Writ large, the fear and horrors of thermonuclear war no doubt gave the Soviets and American leaders pause, both during stable times and during crisis. That said, one can't read this history without some feeling of terror. On the safety side, I'm sure many of you have seen er Eric Schlosser's recent book, Command and Control, which builds on a lot of the terrific work by Scott Sagan in highlighting mistakes, accidents, and near misses that plague nuclear management. Um, reading the documents on both sides of the Cold War during the 1958 to 1961 Berlin Crisis, the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, or the set of challenges during 1983 in NATO's Able Archer exercise should give one pause. Perhaps even more importantly, the most important and dangerous crises of the Cold War were generated by the very existence of nuclear weapons. In other words, if one tried to construct a counterfactual of what the Cuban Missile Crisis or the Berlin Crisis would look like in a world without nuclear weapons, you couldn't because these crises wouldn't happen. They were nuclear crises at their core. Even the crises over West Berlin from 1958 to 1961, if they were, as we now believe, initiated by the Soviet Union to express their anger over the United States moving to arm the West German Bundeswehr with nuclear weapons, it's a nuclear crisis to its core. In a non-nuclear world, what are the odds that the West would do anything to defend an isolated city, deep in enemy territory, surrounded by overwhelming Warsaw Pact conventional superiority. Right? To do anything to defend that would be a suicide mission. To defend it only made sense with the existence of nuclear weapons. The crisis over Euro missiles in the late 70s, the Soviet fear of a NATO first strike, and, and the US fear of the same. It's hard to create the counterfactual where these occur in a non-nuclear world. So it's worth at least asking, could it be that in a non-nuclear Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union, and NATO and the Warsaw Pact, balance each other out perfectly, grudgingly accepting each other's sphere of influence, and avoiding major crises? And in fact, if you look at the documents from the mid-1960s on, and this was shocking to me, uh, most of the Americans didn't think the Soviets were coming. And in fact, if you look at the crises that really scared them from the mid-1960s on, it would be something like the West Germans developing their own nuclear capability, and the U.S. would have to decide whether it cooperated with the Soviets to take out the West German nuclear. So this is not kind of the Cold War we were sort of used to thinking of. Now, I'm not suggesting nuclear weapons didn't stabilize. What I'm saying is that it's not entirely obvious that you couldn't construct a case that you wouldn't have stability between the East and the West in a non-nuclear world. It's a scenario at least worth thinking about. It. Second big important question that we act like we have answers to, but I would suggest the answers are more elusive than scholars indicate. Why do states pursue nuclear weapons? And why have far fewer pursued nuclear weapons than anyone would have predicted in 1955, 1975, or even 1995? You go through the declassified documents and you see NIEs and a variety of other documents that again and again say, we're at the verge of a nuclear tipping point. We should expect 20, 30, 40 nuclear weapon states in the near future. And yet that world does not arrive. And there's a question here. If nuclear weapons are these wonderful security providing entities, why don't more states have them? Is a less nuclearized world um, the product of the 1968 Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty? Is it because of an emerging norm or even taboo against the use or even possession of these weapons? Is it because of the demands of being an open, politically liberal, capitalistic state conflict with the, other, with the goal of nuclear weapons, as Attila Soligen has claimed? Are nuclear weapons sought by states desiring prestige or autocrats seeking to cement their leadership position? 
has a relatively stable, peaceful international environment decreased the appeal of nuclear weapons? These are just a handful of the arguments that are made by scholars about why uh, states do or do not um, uh, pursue nuclear weapons. I've made my own argument in a recent uh, international security piece, and I think the answer actually is to be found in America's, uh, US, the U.S.'s uh, very vigorous nuclear nonproliferation efforts, and that the, for any number of reasons that I can go into details, the U.S. has made what I call inhibition or nuclear nonproliferation policy, a centerpiece of American grand strategy, as important and sometimes even more important than containment and liberal uh, internationalism. Um, but again, I'm just participating in a debate upon which we actually don't fully know and of which we have lots uh, of arguments. Um, I will note one very interesting surprise in the historical record, again, something that was not part of how people theorized about these questions 20 or 30 years ago, is that if you look in uh, American documents about where the real nonproliferation efforts were, they were oriented more towards friends than they were enemies. If you look at the amount of effort the U.S. spent keeping Taiwan, South Korea, West Germany, Japan, Australia, Italy, Sweden, countries like this, non-nuclear, um, uh, that's actually one of the interesting stories that's emerged from the document, and for understandable reasons, not very talked about, right? Uh, you see a complicit cooperation between, with the Soviet Union and the United States on this front. And this is not one of these things you want to advertise. Oh, by the way, we're working with our hated enemy against the security interests of our close friends. Let's make a big speech about that, right? But as you kind of uncover the documents, you see that this nonproliferation story is a, a, a little bit different. But the point is there, even though I've offered my own arguments and I certainly didn't express any uncertainty in the article I wrote, I, if I'm honest with myself, we, we don't really know. We don't actually fully understand why every prediction about the number of nuclear weapon states that would be on the planet by this point were wrong. If you had told someone in 1960 or 19, even 1975, that there would be nine nuclear weapon states in 2016, and that nuclear weapons would have never been used, they would have said, hallelujah, how do I sign up for that world? All these people were talking about the kind of MPT and it's weak and all this, they would have said, how, that's a miracle, right? So, but we don't really fully understand that. So that's the second question um, that I think, even though lots of people offer very strident arguments, we should be honest and humble about our lack of certainty. Third big question is an age-old question, one that um, uh, people debate and argue about all the time, but again, I don't think we have full answers. And that is the old, how much is enough? In other words, what are the force and strategy requirements for nuclear deterrence? Are, is deterring your homeland different than the requirements needed for protecting your allies? How about for reassuring your allies, which is different than protecting your allies. Maybe for coercing your allies. Can a state achieve meaningful nuclear superiority? And if so, what are the supposed benefits of achieving such primacy? This is a complex set of questions, but even during the Cold War there was big debates about this. If you look at how the academic world has approached this question, you have big thinkers like Bernard Brody and Robert Jervis and Ken Waltz. They essentially argued, and I'd say that this was the consensus view in the 1970s, that once you achieved a certain level of security, you have a secure second strike, and we can debate about what that is, but essentially you could take a hit and you have enough left over to meaningfully destroy the other society, well, that's enough. Why do any more? Because you couldn't do any more. Anything else that was spent would be a waste of money. And in fact, it appeared that the policy world agreed with this. You know, in 1972, you have the uh, strategic arms limitations and anti-ballistic missile treaties, which seem to enshrine this notion that seeking to do more than having mutual deterrence is a pointless and uh, ridiculous exercise, and that to have this mad world is to achieve stability. But a funny thing happened, and of course, this is a world that all of you are familiar with, 
almost immediately upon signing SALT and ABM, the United States undertook a massive increase in uh, its qualitative nuclear forces, right? If you think of from the early 1970s on and the tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars spent on things like Trident D5, the Peacekeeper, the B1 and B2, cruise missiles and Pershing II, upgrades to C, uh, C cubed I, missile defense, and massive investments in ASW and silent, uh, uh, sub-silencing, right? A massive amount of money. And when you think about it, all of these forces were oriented towards counterforce, right? The ability to hit your enemy's weapons, which if you really think about it and you're honest with yourself, are actually first strike weapons. And you say to yourself, what, what was going on here? At the very least, even if they're not first strike weapons, they're certainly not weapons that are conducive to strategic stability. So at, you have a, a, an irony, right? At the same time that you've enshrined quantitative equivalency with the Soviets, you undertake a 20 year program of massive investments seeking qualitative superiority, right? And this is something that the scholars are for just starting to look into and haven't really kind of uh, figured out. But the sort of Brodies, you know, the Waltzes, the Jervises of the world, they couldn't make any sense of this. You know, Bob Jervis wrote a book called The Illogic of American Nuclear Strategy, as if this was all sort of kind of invented out of thin air. And the big intellectual question is what did policymakers think they were getting for this massive invest in, investment um, for systems that arguably undermine strategic stability? And did they get what they sought? And again, this is a historical question. We're getting some very interesting archival material on the Soviet side that actually says they understood exactly what the United States was doing. They believed the United States was trying to achieve meaningful superiority. It scared the hell out of them. They attempted to keep up, and that in that effort to keep up, it highlighted many of the problems that were inherent within the Soviet economy and the Soviet defense procurement uh, system. It's a very, very controversial and important set of issues. Um, you, know, you could see where this story goes. Now, you know, a lot of what I'm suggesting here is I'm doing one of the things historians should never do, which is to look back and see that the story was all clean and all preordained because actually in the process of history being made, it's all messy. People can believe in stability and believe in primacy at the same time. They can all be filled with lots of contradictions. But again, this is a narrative that's emerging that is very much at odds with the conventional wisdom. Just as a side note, it's interesting to contrast Soviet reactions to this U.S. effort to change the how much is enough and to see that China is doing something much differently. Um, you know, China has a vigorous foreign policy. It's building stuff. But I think if you get right down to it, it's building far, far less than it could or <coughs> that it might. And you say to yourself, well, why is this? And I, I've got a hypothesis on this. It's just sort of pulling stuff out of the air. But the Chinese are very keen observers of what the Soviets did and what mistakes they made. And I think they came to the conclusion that the last thing you want to do is to compete with the United States on a playing field that's capital intensive, technology intensive, plays advantage to American strengths. It's a whole another set of issues we can talk about. But the main point that I want to make here is that these are big historical questions. The answers to which will shape how you think about policy. And that many people go into policy debates with their assumptions about how the world works based on answers to these historical questions that I contend they perhaps hold a little too strongly than they might. So why does this happen? This brings me to the, the second sort of set of um, issues I want to talk about, and that is the gaps within the various nuclear communities, or the, the people interested in nuclear policy. Because as I lay out questions like the three that I set out, I could give you my own thoughts. And I spent a lot of time in the archives thinking about this stuff. But on each of them, I would be willing to acknowledge that my level of certainty on coming up with an answer is not particularly high. Now, as a historian, you know, historians travel in uncertainty all the time. That is not probably a world that engineers like in the least, right? So we are about as 
differently structured in thinking about uncertainty as possible. Um, but at the very least, these three unanswered, or at least these questions that are open for further investigation, uh, you would think that the nuclear studies community would embrace these and say, we don't know the answers either. Let's investigate them because the answers to these historical questions shape how you think about the important policy questions that I set up at the beginning of the talk. And there's at least five gaps uh, that I've identified of communities that are stovepipe that don't seem, um, each of these communities um, claim to speak with great authority on nuclear politics, yet their answers and views of the world could not be more different. The first gap is between policymakers and scholars, two totally different worlds. Right? I could go into this in greater length. Um, I wrote a piece about this a couple years ago with uh, Jim Steinberg right after he left the Obama administration, and we both disagreed on what to do about Iran's nuclear program. But what was clear was that the way academics think about risk and uncertainty is completely different than the way policymakers think about risk and uncertainty. So, and I was guilty of this too in my nuclear alarmism piece where I said, you know, nuclear terrorism vastly overestimated as a risk. Well, you, as you think about it, you can understand why a policymaker has a completely different risk profile about how to think about these issues than an academic. Yet, they rarely are able to speak to each other because they don't even recognize these different risk, um, uh, risk um, profiles. The second gap between the U.S. and the rest of the world. Here in the U.S., in a building like this, deterrence is taken for granted. You know, it's sort of mom, apple pie, baseball, and nuclear deterrence. You go immediately and travel anywhere else, and that is not how it works. And I'm not talking about traveling in kind of, uh, you know, leftist confabs. I'm talking about sort of in the heart of places like London and Vienna and Geneva, where disarmament is seen as a serious, responsible policy choice. And it is seen not just as a policy necessity, but as a moral necessity. Um, I was at a talk at Oxford a couple months ago with um, the Viennese um, foreign minister who had been sort of one of the fathers of the humanitarian consequences movement. This idea that not only is the use of nuclear weapons immoral, the mere possession of them is immoral. Now this, this was not some wild hair Berkeley leftist, right? This was a guy who was a serious, serious diplomat. And his position and his ideas were taken very seriously. Now I'm not to say which is right or wrong, but this gap is enormous between is what we might call team deterrence and team disarmament. And it strikes me as problematic, right? And our normal inclination is if we're on one team or the other, to, is to dismiss the other as to having, you know, completely foolish ideas. And I don't think that's very helpful. The third big gap within scholarly communities, um, between historians and political scientists, between social scientists and scientists and engineers, even within these communities, within the political science community, between those who use quantitative and formal methods versus those who use um, qualitative methods. I've been struck as I've tried to kind of understand all these different perspectives, how, and it's natural, I mean, it happens in any academic enterprise, these communities become stovepipe. And they don't speak to each other. They don't refer to each other. Fourth, which I think is one that's really interesting, Neil and I were talking about this on the way over, between the nuclear nonproliferation crowd and the nuclear strategy crowd. The origins of most of our theoretical work on nuclear dynamics came from the nuclear strategy crowd, the sort of RAND people, people like Schelling and Wallstetter and Bernard Brody. The nuclear proliferation was, to be honest, kind of an intellectual backwater. Then the Cold War ended, nuclear strategy seemed less interesting, and all of a sudden this nuclear nonproliferation um, uh, crowd seemed to be in the ascendant. But what's interesting about it is that anyone who knows how policy works is that what drove a lot of U.S. nuclear strategy, that seeking primacy that I mentioned earlier, part of that was, of course, 
its challenge to the Soviet Union, but part of that was the requirements of extended deterrence. And extended deterrence is all about nonproliferation. The reason, the only reason you want to protect West Germany, now Germany, Japan, South Korea, Australia, is you don't want them to have nuclear weapons. In an insecure world, they're going to get nuclear weapons, and you don't want that for any number of reasons. So nuclear strategy and nuclear nonproliferation are joined at the hip. Yet you could be on team deterrence and say, well, we don't really care about nuclear nonproliferation because these weapons are stabilizing. We don't really care if people get them. They did good things for us. Other people should have them. Or you should be on team disarmament and say, nuclear weapons are all bad. We need to get rid of them, and the US needs to reduce. Not realizing that both of those positions end up undermining important goals that you have. Right? You go down and push dis, uh, disarmament, you undermine your extended deterrent. You emphasize the utility importance of nuclear weapons, you make them very attractive to lots of other people. Yet these two communities don't really talk and engage with each other. And this is one that's true both in the academic world, but also in the policy world. And right? I'm sure all of you can know you've got your people that you know that are non-pro people and people that are strategy people. The final gap is the one that I started out with, and that's certainty versus uncertainty. Again, I don't mean this to be some postmodern statement about the elusiveness of knowledge and the importance of relative perspective and uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff. What I mean to say is that these questions are incredibly, incredibly important and very, very difficult. And at heart, what we really care about when we're honest with ourselves is to make sure we don't have a nuclear war. And fortunately, since 1945, we haven't had any. And we're not entirely sure why. We've got very strong instincts and intuitions about it. And I would add as a side note, things have changed over time, right? Deterrence and how people thought about nuclear weapons does shift, right? We, you know, I'm a materialist at heart, but ideas matter. The notion that nuclear weapons might have been usable in 1955 and 1965, attitudes both on a, sort of a cultural level but also on a political level have changed quite a bit. But the fact is that we shouldn't be afraid to embrace the uncertainty and the humility that comes with it, to say many of our very passionately held policy arguments are built on a foundation of an understanding of the past that is incomplete at best. Right? And going into a policy argument, just like going into an academic argument, saying, you know what, we're really uncertain about these things, is probably not a winning strategy. But given that these questions are so important, I think we need to find a way to create a space where we can accept that level of uncertainty accept that level of humility, and bring, close these gaps of these different communities so that we could create a shared and common conversation about what I think is the most important global challenge that we face. Thank you. <laughs>